Last week, we brought you the story of Vera Searle, one of the athletes whose participation at the Women's World Games in the 1920s pioneered the way for women to be included in the Olympic Games. This week, we begin a three-part series focusing on a group of female athletes who benefited from Vera's exploits, East Germany's Sprint Queens. It all started in 1949 when Walter Ulbricht, soon to become head of East Germany's Communist Party, announced that his country's athletes would become ambassadors in tracksuits. Sport had a very high profile in East Germany. And whilst it was good on the one hand that children could play sport for free, on the other hand, sport became a prestigious object. The successes of our athletes on the track enabled the state to cover itself in glory. In pursuit of his goal, Ulbricht sanctioned the creation of a network of research institutes into sports medicine. Billions of Ostmarks were channeled into so-called cultural activities, thus enabling the German Gymnastics and Sports Association to provide equipment and finance research into ways to improve the performances of the ambassadors. But centers such as this one at Kreischer near Dresden were only part of the story. The reason why East German athletes were so successful was that talented youngsters were selected to attend special boarding schools, where their sporting careers were developed systematically. The schools would encourage them to attend track and field meets from an early age, and these meets then became part of their lives. The state also ensured that places of work were guaranteed. The boarding schools served to combine sport and education, with the emphasis very much on the former. And despite playing a key role in the development of Olympic medalists, they were criticized for abusing the rights of their pupils. The days were difficult, and I often asked myself how I got through it. We were woken at six, had breakfast, and then had lessons from seven until nine o'clock. From 9.30, we had two hours training, then lunch, and then more lessons before another session of training until 6 p.m. It was difficult, but I have no regrets, as I enjoyed it, and it stood me in good stead. By the time his boarding school system began to pay dividends in stadia around the world, Ulbricht had been succeeded by Erich Honecker as first secretary of the SA Day. Honecker carried on his predecessor's work, and it was in West Germany of all places, at the 1972 Olympic Games in Munich, that East Germany's female athletes began their domination of the sprint disciplines. Midway through a 90-race unbeaten streak, Renata Stecher became the first ambassador to deliver Olympic sprint gold, with world record victories over 100 and 200 meters. The finals of the 100 and 200 meters were over very quickly. And thankfully, I reached the line first. When I went to the Munich Games in 1972, I never imagined I would be so successful. I knew that I was good, but didn't put any pressure on myself. Just tried to do enough in each round to make it through to the final. Once I was there, I had nothing to lose, and I was lucky enough to win both races. Four years later, in Montreal, the first woman to break 11 seconds for the 100 meters failed in the defense of her titles, finishing second in the 100 and third here over 200 meters. But as Stecher bade farewell to the Olympics, others appeared to take her place. Bebel Eckert, the winner of the 200 meters in Montreal, and Marlies Gurr. Like Stecher, Gurr attended the boarding school affiliated to the successful sports club SC Morte Jena. Gurr's talents had been spotted at an early age, when she began out sprinting her fellow pupils, female and male, at primary school. 
Once at the boarding school, the young Marlies, like Renata before her, was forced to try her hand at a variety of track and field disciplines before finally being allowed to concentrate on sprinting. It wasn't immediately obvious that Ger and Stecker would be stars of the future. They were very talented and at the age of 16 or 17 were already running fast times. While their talents weren't that obvious when they joined us, we always hoped they'd be successful. Having found her forte, Ger assumed the mantle vacated by Stecker and set about dominating the 100 metres, winning three consecutive European titles and the inaugural world title in Helsinki in 1983. Despite all her achievements, the 39-year-old child psychologist still has nightmares about the one that got away. The lowest point of my career came at the 1980 Olympic Games in Moscow, when I didn't win gold. I was given the same time as Ludmila Kondracheva in the 100 metres, but she got the gold. I'm still not sure about that result today. <laughs> The slow motion replay appeared to show that Gurr, nearest the camera, had indeed won gold. It still hurts now, but I guess it was my fault as I should have been a step quicker. Whilst the Moscow Games remain ultimately forgettable for Marlies Gurr, for another East German athlete, the Games of the 22nd Olympiad were a crowning glory. Marita Koch was the outstanding 200 and 400 meter runner of her generation and in Moscow she was hoping to make up for the disappointment of Montreal when injury forced her out of the 400 meter semi-final. From a psychological point of view, I was at my wit's end and my legs were like jelly when I entered the stadium. I remember Irina Zhivinska coming over to me to wish me luck. The race itself went quite well, and when I crossed the line, I was absolutely delighted. It was such a weight off my shoulders. Between 1972 and 1988, East Germany's sprint queens won 24 out of a possible 44 medals at the four summer Olympiads in which they competed, leading many of the vanquished to question the legitimacy of their methods. I don't think there was any cover-up back then, as has since been suggested. In my opinion, it's a bit absurd to suggest that we cheated our way to victory. The USA produced a number of talented athletes in a variety of sports, but nobody ever questioned their success. So why were the East German sprinters so successful? We had vast reserves of magic shoes, and the strange thing is that when I put them on today, I'm as fast as I was back in 1972. That's the secret of our success. <laughs> Next week, those magic shoes come under closer scrutiny as the two Germanys move towards reunification. In this, the second in our three-part series on East Germany's sprint queens, we profile two athletes who carried the hopes and expectations of an entire nation on their shoulders as the two Germanys moved towards reunification. In 1988, at the Seoul Olympics, the East German sprint tradition was carried on by Heike Drexler in the far lane with bronze medal performances in both the 100 and 200 metres. Whilst her achievements further enhanced the reputation of East Germany's female sprinters, there were those who remained sceptical about the legitimacy of their methods, suggesting that institutionalised drug abuse was widespread in Eastern Europe. With the events in Berlin on November the 9th, 1989, many observers expected that East Germany's ability to produce such talented female sprinters would come to an end. But in Neubrandenburg, 135 kilometers north of Berlin, two young women had been primed for glory, Grit Breuer and Katrin Kreiber. I started running at an early age. 
I think it was at school when I was about 10 years old. Prior to that, I did a bit of gymnastics and played handball. I was asked if I wanted to join the athletics group. I joined, enjoyed it, and carried on doing it. Kaba and Breuer announced themselves to the world of athletics in 1988, just two months before the Seoul Olympics. With victories in the 200 and 400 metres respectively at the World Junior Championships in Sudbury, Canada, Kaba and Breuer helped East Germany top the medals table. Two years later, at the European Senior Championships in Split, Yugoslavia, the pair represented the last East German team to compete at a major track and field championships. The dynamic duo provided East Germany with a fitting finale to its 18-year domination of the sprint disciplines. Kreiber completed a golden double with victories over 100 and 200 metres. For her part, Breuer, still a junior, outclassed Francis marie josé Perec, amongst others, to win the 400 metres in a world junior record time of 49.5 seconds. Split was my first senior success. I was only 18 and it was an amazing experience, my best triumph. I remember standing on the rostrum and bursting into tears. It was an emotional moment for me, one I'll never forget. There were more emotional moments less than two months later as two nations became one. Whilst reunification of the two Germanys was initially welcomed by many in the East, for those who'd been involved in track and field in East Germany, things were about to get worse. Reunification had a huge influence on athletics in the former East Germany. Many of the coaches lost their jobs and the entire selection process, which had been so important, was disbanded. But for those athletes like Breuer and Kreiber who'd already graduated through the infamous boarding school system in the East, the effects of reunification were far from detrimental. Indeed, competing under a new flag, 1991 would prove to be their best year. I was very surprised when I won the 100 metres in Tokyo. I knew before the World Championships the sort of performance that would be needed to win, and I was always able to raise my performance for the big races. After seeing the other semi-finals, I went into the final knowing that I could win. With a repeat of her golden double of split, Kaba was the star of the third World Championships in Tokyo in 1991. Awards flooded in, including Transworld Sports Sportswoman of the Year Award, but her sights were now set on Olympic gold. And that's when it all went wrong. Neither Kraber nor Breuer made it to Barcelona. Shortly after reunification, the public viewing of files kept by East Germany's secret police suggested that some of the country's sprinters had been fed cocktails of drugs to enhance their performances. Then, during a training camp in South Africa, six months before Barcelona, Kreiber and Breuer were two of three athletes accused of tampering with urine samples given to a team of German medical officers. The German Athletics Association, the DLV, banned the trio for four years. <laughs> An appeal followed and the DLV revoked the suspensions, a decision later reinforced by the International Amateur Athletics Federation, the IAAF. The pair were free to compete again, but the emotional ordeal had taken its toll. To help his charges, coach Thomas Springstein allegedly gave Breuer, Kreiber and another athlete, Manuela Der, non-prescribed clenbuterol, on the understanding that it was not on the IAAF's list of banned substances. A few weeks prior to Barcelona, the trio failed a random drugs test. I still feel that we were treated wrongly. I was punished for three years for something which wasn't on our doping list. Today, you get a two-year ban for doping. And I got three years for taking a substance which wasn't even on the banned list. This time there was to be no reprieve and the trio received a one-year ban from the DLV and a further two-year suspension from the IAAF. Each acted in an unsportsmanlike manner. The fall from grace of Catherine Kreiber, Greg Boyer and East German sprinting in general suggested to many that drug abuse had indeed played a major role in enabling East Germany's women to dominate the sprint disciplines. Perhaps then, it's surprising that of the 41 athletes who tested positive for drugs at the six summer Olympiads between 1968 and 1988, none was from East Germany. 
It is possible, if such abuse was rife, that the coaches and athletes are one step ahead of the authorities. But as Breuer's coach explains, there are other reasons for the decline in East German sprinting. I think the lack of success is due to the fact that the East German sports system no longer exists. Whilst it was probably an uneconomical system, it was excellent for the athletes, as they were very well supported. Kraber and Breuer were both products of this system, and five years on are free to compete once again. At 27, Kraber may still have a couple of good years ahead of her, but her outlook has changed, and now married with a young son, Kraber the sportswoman has become Kraber the businesswoman, with a partnership in a sports shop in Neubrandenburg. Her career is over, but her fight for compensation goes on. As for Breuer, she's back in the business of winning races. And next week, in the final part of our series, we'll take a look at her prospects for the future and meet the next generation of sprinters in the former East Germany. In this, the final part of our series on East Germany's sprint queens, we go west to meet the comeback kid and Jenny East to assess the effects of reunification on the production line of Olympic gold medalists. The suspension of Grit Breuer and Katrin Kraber in 1992 robbed German athletics of two of its medal-winning hopes for the Barcelona Olympics. Indeed, at those games, the unified Germany's team of female athletes failed to win an individual sprint medal. The trend which has since continued. German athletics isn't the dominant force it once was. We win fewer medals now, mostly in the throwing events. In female sprinting, we don't even make the finals, and that's far from satisfactory. The comparatively poor performance of female sprinters from the former East Germany, post Graber and Breuer, adds weight to the argument that illegal methods had been employed during the GDR's domination of the sprint disciplines. But more than that, it also highlights the undoubted qualities of training programs, coaches and facilities that were in place prior to reunification. There is no doubt that the fall of communism had a detrimental effect on sport in East Germany, with one of the victims being the boarding school system. Despite widespread criticism, these schools had been responsible for producing a long line of Olympic gold medalists in a variety of disciplines, and for the staff at the sports clubs associated with them, the events of November 1989 were a watershed. After reunification, we had to familiarize ourselves with the social market economy, as the central support from the state was no longer there. Coaches were no longer being paid, and many of them were made redundant. The highly successful talent spotting program collapsed, the training centers were closed down, and it was left to the clubs to try and rescue the system which had been so successful. But come to terms with it, they did, and in Jena, the club that produced Renate Stecher, Marli Skur and Heike Deichsler is on the way to reviving its glory days. Financed by its members' contributions and various sponsorship deals, TUS Jena is an independent organization, and whilst it no longer has any formal links with the former boarding school next door, many of the gymnasium's sporting talents are members of the club. TUS Jena offers its members a variety of sports, but does so on a tighter budget than that enjoyed by its predecessor, the highly successful East German club SC Motor Jena. With less money to spend, fewer coaches and administrators are employed on a full-time basis, and the club relies on volunteers to keep it afloat. One of those, himself a former athlete, is not that surprised about the downturn in fortunes of female sprinters from East Germany. We're constantly reminded of the excellent achievements of the 1970s and 1980s. But it is very difficult for us to reproduce the results of the past. We found ourselves in a big hole after reunification, and we must realize that the basic foundations are no longer in place. 
But it's not just the infrastructure that's disappeared. As the region's athletics coach explains, reunification removed one of the incentives to take up the sport. Back then, the motivation for the youngsters to try out athletics was the opportunity to travel to capitalist countries. The young athletes were prepared to train very hard for that carrot. Nowadays, though, we can travel wherever we want to, and therefore the carrot is no longer there. Thankfully, Tursiena's current crop of talented athletes are too young to remember life in the former East Germany, and for them, athletics is not simply a means to an end. I started off doing gymnastics, but my mother, who used to be an athlete, suggested that I take up athletics, so I did, and I love it. Despite all she's been through, Grit Breuer, the 1991 World Championship silver medalist over 400 metres, is still in love with athletics. She trained as a secretary during her suspension, but she was always keen to make a return to the track. And to facilitate that process, she dropped her claims for compensation from the German Athletics Association for fear of upsetting the very people for whom she wanted to compete. Now based in Hanover in Western Germany, she returned to competition in September 1995 and made the German team for the Atlanta Olympics just 10 months later. Having made the final of the 400 metres, finishing eighth behind France's Marie-José Perec, Breuer's late surge helped Germany to its first Olympic sprint medal since reunification, a bronze in the 4x400-metre relay. The fact that Breuer's comeback coincided with a return to medal-winning performances came as no surprise to a former Olympic champion. Today's success stories come from the former East Germany, and the reason that they're successful is that they had a good grounding and have built on that. One such athlete, Anja Röcker, was also on the relay team in Atlanta, and she's the first post-war sprint queen to hail from Jena. Having assumed the mantle vacated by Stecherger and Drexler as Jena's number one, Röcker has her sights set on emulating their achievements. My long-term goal is the Sydney Olympics. I also want to do well in both the 400 metres and in the relay in Athens at this year's World Championships. <laughs> Chasing her hard in Athens and Sydney will be Breuer, who, at 25, retains her appetite for success. My motivation is as high now as it was back then. Having been through what I've experienced, I now know how quickly things can turn sour and how quickly you can hit rock bottom. I've had a difficult time, and I'll do my best to get the most out of the years I have left in the sport. Fritz Breuer and Anja Röcke are the role models for today's youngsters from Eastern Germany, and whilst the achievements of their predecessors remain shrouded in controversy, future gold medal performances will go some way to shifting the spotlight, so that success on the track is no longer attributed solely to drugs. Over the past three weeks, Transworld Sport has profiled a sprinting dynasty and will continue to keep pace with the heirs to their throne as the production line of talent gears up for yet more golden glory.